Welcome to Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. Now let's join our host, Tom Shorkey. Welcome to Conversations. I'm Tom Shorkey, your host for today's program. With me today is a Marine City resident, actual graduate of Marine City High School. But what we're here to talk about is what he has done with that chunk of time from walking out of the halls of good old Marine City High School until today on the set of Conversations. My guest today is Bob Parcell. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Tom. Good to be here. Bob, uh, we're going to talk automotive today because that's been your career with General Motors. And we are going to get to the fact that with your last posting, you had responsibilities for probably 13 or so manufacturing operations, three different continents, including Australia, Asia and Africa, in and out of eight or 10 different countries, Kenya, South Africa, you had Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia. I mean, probably the list goes on. But before we get to your passport, let's talk about Grown up in Marine City. Give us a couple reflections of young Bobby Parcell. Okay, sure. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I've been here my entire life, um, except for all the travels that work uh, required. Um, went to Washington Elementary School, um, and then, of course, uh, Marine City High. Graduated from Marine City High in 79. Um, just the uh, the quaintness of the town, you know, the uh, walk into, it used to be called Luke's, now it's uh, the dry dock, because uh, I lived on Mary Street, and I'd walk to school at, at Washington. Uh, my whole family was born and raised here, um, as far as my sister and brother. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, played, a, played a few sports while I was in high school, uh, basketball, baseball, football. But it was a, a typical childhood, I think. Uh, well, growing it, up then with your little league, your high school, your teachers, your coaches, a couple of those names stick out with you that uh, maybe you thought maybe made a difference in your life along the way. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, a couple of the couple of the coaches and, and teachers. Uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Golding, who was my basketball coach, uh, math teacher. Uh, he, uh, he had a certain way of uh, um, teaching you right from wrong. Uh, M- Mr. McKenzie, Don McKenzie, who was my Little League coach, uh, he, was, uh, he was almost a mentor to me. That's great. Uh, Those are two great names. Don yeah. McKenzie, I've kind of forgotten about him. What was the name of your Little League team? Cool. You're gonna what have to. T- you're testing me or- there. Orioles or no? I, I'm trying to think. I think we it. were the Yankees. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I think go. we were the Yankees. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned Mr. Golding, who was everybody who went through Marine City Middle School had Mr. Golding for a coach or a teacher along the way, and yeah. he ended up taking that girls' basketball team in 1977 at Marine City High to the state championship. That's right. So yeah. you you mentioned a couple notables. Yeah. When you got ready to leave Marine City High. You, uh, you made an option for college that a lot of people aren't always aware of, but I think it's an extraordinary opportunity, and that was the General Motors Institute, right. which I think has a new name now, but tell me what GMI was in 1979. Yeah, GMI, which is now called Kettering University, uh, was a, uh, uh, a university for, or an institute back then, Instit- <laughs> that didn't sound right. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I went there into an institution. I think you should have been in an <laughs> yeah. institution, maybe. Yeah, um, yeah it, it, uh, it was focused on engineering, uh, mechanical, electrical, civil. Um, and it was, a, it was sponsored with General Motors. Uh, so you had this co-op program that last, it, it was actually a five-year program instead of a four-year program like most colleges. Uh, where you'd, you'd, you'd alternate between um, school and work uh, every three months. Um, really highly recommended school. It was, 
probably in the top 10 of uh, technical schools in the, in the country. Do you have to be now, if somebody listening had a, uh, a math science student uh, in one of our high schools and said, gee, Kettering, how, how do you get into Kettering? Is it a thing where you apply or do you have to be kind of nominated like the Air Force Academy or no, something yeah. like that? No, you apply, but you, there's some very strict requirements, uh, grade point, SAT, ACT. They have to be in the, the upper echelon, the, the 90th percentile. So, And then when you finish uh, General Motors Institute, um, and at that time it was just, that was General Motors, it, it was GMI. Now it's Kettering, and is my understanding that now it's not just General Motors, it's well, what else? Yeah, what there, else there's it? a lot of uh, different companies now. Um, from automotive companies, you know, all the big three are in there now. Um, some of the foreign uh, car companies are in there. Uh, a lot of, uh, well, if you think of anything that, need, that has engineers or mm -hmm. needs engineers, um, they're, they're probably in there somewhere. Oh, good. Now, when you finish GMI, you talk about your early career at General Motors. First two, three, four, five year. What do they did they move you around, or or do you find your niche of expertise, or how, how does that work? Well, I I started in uh, in Flint, which was my co-op experience, um, and then shortly, uh, actually before I graduated from GMI, I was out in in Grand Rapids, and spent about ten years in Grand Rapids, Michigan, doing. Uh, a variety of maintenance, um, supervisory jobs, engineering jobs, I actually ran a powerhouse. Um, and then, then I, my first big move, I'd say, was uh, Mansfield, Ohio. And that was when I became an executive and started um, running an entire production um, area. And when I would see the different operations that you were in charge of, it looks to me as I had mentioned earlier, back in my former career, if I was looking for employees, it was usually a red flag if they changed jobs every two years. But it seems like that's what you do when you're kind of on a fast track with General Motors because it appeared to me you were in and out of Ohio two or three different times at different types of plants. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, it, you know, it, um, three times, three different times in Ohio, twice two different times in, in, in Michigan, Kentucky, Missouri, Canada, uh, and then the big move to uh, uh, Singapore. Now, before we get to Singapore, let's talk, you've got, you and your wife, Jean, have three boys, so they kind of got raised in different spots, but um, because you moved around, your family moved a little bit, just, Tell us where those three boys are located right now. Uh, the, the youngest son is in Columbus, Ohio. He, he works in the finance industry. The uh, middle son is in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And he's, uh, he's actually part of the Maven project for General Motors, which is like Uber mm -hmm. slash Lyft. Um, and then the oldest is uh, in Lansing, Michigan. And the oldest is in the, is that, he's the one that's in the movie or the He's the finance one that, he's, world? yes, well, most definitely. He, yeah. uh, he went to the New York Film Academy out in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, he's act, he actually made a feature film here in, in Rain City. Now, he's a diehard Wolverine uh, growing up that way with a big black M flying on your garage. How, do you, how is it having a son living in Columbus, Ohio? Well, living there is okay. Uh, however, the middle son actually uh, went to the uh, the Ohio State University. Ah, well, that's good. Uh, no, it isn't. It, <laughs> that, that was uh, that's the toughest checks I've ever yeah. written. The Ohio State University. Right. And then one of your spots when you were um, on one of your posts in the United States, you were in Kentucky, and was it the Corvette plant you yes. were? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, that was uh, actually one of the shortest uh, 
positions I had as well. It, was, it lasted about nine months. Um, but every day I got to drive a Corvette, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, because I noticed you drove out to the interview with a Chevy pickup today, right. so I know where your heart lies. That's right. Uh, somewhere along the line, somebody tapped you on the shoulder from General Motors and said, Bob, we got a job for you. And with your background, you're probably thinking, well, it's going to be Ohio or Michigan or right. Missouri or wherever. And they said Singapore. Yep. What was your first reaction and maybe your wife's first reaction when you came home and said, hey, honey, I'm going to Singapore? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, I, I wasn't sure where Singapore was. <laughs> you know, I thought it was part of China. Yeah. Uh, that, that's not true. It's, a, it's its own little country south of Malaysia. It's an island, uh, one of the busiest ports in the world. Um, so yeah, we, I went out on a, on a look-see, and it, it, the country itself is beautiful. It's just, it's always 80 degrees and most of the time sunny, uh, very clean. Um, but yeah, that was a bit of a shocker. Uh, now, when in Singapore, which, as I did a little bit of research when I knew you were going to come in, uh, it is, it's very, it's highly rated for education, health benefits, it's a financial hub um, yeah. in Southeast Asia, and uh, one of the largest, as we see these container ships uh, with all these railroad cars on them, it's like the largest or the second largest uh, container ship yeah, exactly. port in the world. Yeah. Now, but when you're there, it's not like, well, I'm going to work in Singapore and walk across the street to the, to the shop or the factory. You actually had, at that time, Australia. You had Africa, with some, like South Africa, which is probably the longest trip. You had Kenya, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia. How, how does one guy cover that territory? Is there like a rotation or something? How do you... How do you keep track of things? Uh, well, I, I, I'd go on plant visits, you know, so I'd go out to the manufacturing sites uh, in all those different countries uh, about every three months. So I'd cycle through them, spend a couple days in each facility, mostly just seeing if they needed help, resources, um, you know, some guidance, anything like that. Just, you know, stop in and it's like checking on your kids, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's good. What uh, what was the longest trip when you were in Singapore and you had to go to one of your constituents? Yeah, South Africa was probably the the hardest one to get to because there was no direct flight to where the where the plant was. Um, so it, it it was probably twelve hours or so, twelve fourteen hours. On the international scene, and I think a lot of people, especially in our area, because we grew up in the shadow of the Motor City and the Big Three and whatever, but there's a significant percentage of, for example, General Motors that is international. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, probably 35% is outside of North America. So, you know, between Asia and Africa, uh, South America, um, Europe, I'm Europe, sure. yeah, what e the... even Uzbekistan. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Well, let me ask this, uh, Bob. With um, what? What's the big challenges when when a guy from the Midwest works his way up, raises kids, has a family, and uh, what was the toughest part about the Singapore assignment? Well, outside of the travel, which, which was a lot, um, just the cultural things. Uh, Singapore itself has a lot of American influence, so that you know the food wasn't like everybody would probably think. You mm -hmm. know, it was there was Italian food, American food, all kinds of different choices. Uh, but then when you go to the other countries, uh, each one has its own culture, uh, each one has its own language, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, getting through those barriers are, are a little tough, and, and the time zones are, like, all over the place, right? 
Well, language, for example. Now, I know in Singapore there is a lot of English spoken, mm -hmm. but say you're going to any of those other spots, what, do you take the translator with you, or does General Motors have somebody when you arrive in Kenya or someplace that make sure that? Yeah, usually just, it's a it's a team member of the plant, um, mm -hmm. so it's not a like a special hired person. It's mm -hmm. just somebody that speaks English and whatever. Uh, language they speak in the country that I'm at, mm -hmm. so it's uh, it's it's not a, like a special assignment kind of person. It's sometimes it was uh, one of the just the team member on the floor, you know, the, the manufacturing guy. Are you uh, when people think of uh, General Motors operations overseas? Uh, are you guys are you making components or parts? Are you actually assembling automobiles? Uh, what, yeah. what what's the deal? Yeah, we, for the most part, it's uh, full manufacturing of automobiles. Um, there are engine plants and transmission plants as well. That that was part of my responsibility over there. Um, so yeah, it's the, it's the full gamut. Same thing we do in in North America. We we do all over. We do, and I know every now and then, and we don't do politics on conversations, but we hear a lot about. Well, why don't you just build stuff in the United States or whatever? But realistically, any car that we see on our roads has probably got parts from numerous nations. Is that an accurate statement? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think you can actually build a car with all American parts. I don't, nobody does it. Hmm. I don't think you could do it. How's the workforce like? Say Southeast Asia. How, how's the workforce? Does, how, what's the comparison with what you were used to when you were in the United States? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the biggest difference is um, they're really hungry to learn mm -hmm. and willing to take ideas and, and just run with them uh, versus having a lot of discussion about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think part of it is that you know there's there's a lot of people that don't have those good paying jobs, so they they're not gonna you know mess with that. They're gonna they're gonna hang they're on gonna to show them. up on time and <laughs> they're gonna right. make sure that that job's theirs and not one of those other 200 guys waiting outside the exactly. gate. Exactly. Type yep. of thing. Yep. Uh, there's got to be some security uh, considerations, I would think, uh, when you work internationally. Um, for example, I saw where General Motors had to just shut down their uh, operations in Venezuela because of w different kinds of unrest. Yeah, uh, right. um, how do you know that when when you're going to go someplace or visit all these countries, uh, is is there a security factor involved? Oh yeah, most definitely. Um, there's a couple things that that General Motors will do for you. Uh, as you go to these countries. Uh, some are higher risk than others, um, and, and it'd probably be surprising which ones are mm -hmm. um, versus which ones are not. Um, typically, um, they would pick you up at the airport, a, a driver. In a couple of the countries, I had a, have a bodyguard. Um, but before all that even happens, there's this security um, group that looks at the, high, the risk level of uh, all the countries. So it's, it's like um, when the uh, Homeland Security used to put out, and it still does Orange, probably. green, yeah. yellow. Same kind of thing. Um, so they, they will not let you travel if, if uh, it's, it's a high risk environment at that time. And there's a lot of the governments that are pretty unstable in those countries. <laughs> I, I would imagine that there are. You did about 30 years in the business, maybe a little bit more. Uh, when you came out of GMI in the early 80s, and now you're looking at uh, the auto industry as we know it today, what are some of the biggest changes that you see? Yeah, I think one is just the technology involved in, in the car itself. Um, you know, there, uh, there's been some studies done where there's, there's actually more technology in a vehicle today than there was in the uh, Apollo mission flight. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and then the technology to build the vehicle. 
um, has advanced um, incredibly, probably 50-fold over what it was when, when I first started in Flint. Um, and so the, the workforce has to be a, much more highly trained, and, and that's difficult as well. I do remember um, people between your age and mine, when they would graduate from one of these local high schools, they could, 18 years old, get a job in one of these car plants, and it might have been lifting a transmission part off, or lifting this, or putting something on a hook, or yep. screwing a fender on, or whatever, and uh, those jobs uh, appear to be long gone. Yeah, I mean, most definitely. It's a, it's a high tech operation now. Yeah. And it's a much safer operation. You know, you think about, I, that, yeah. that was a very good example you just made. Um, you know, that, that's hard on a person's body doing that stuff too. And, you know, they didn't always have all the safety precautions back in 1980 uh, that they do today. And, and well, you know, 20 years ago, you probably even 15 years ago, if you asked people, uh, why don't you carry your computer in your pocket and make phone calls with it, you know? Uh, they go, oh, you're, you're crazy, you right. know? But now everybody in the world's carrying their iPhone or, or whatever around. In the car business, there's been a lot of talk or a lot of uh, news on self-driving vehicles. And I think for a lot of people, they go, oh, okay, maybe. But realistically, what, what does the future look like for self-driving vehicles? Yeah, well, I, I think they'll be here a lot sooner than a lot of people think. Um, there's a whole fleet going driving around them by themselves at the uh, at the Warren Tech Center. Um, I think it's around 50 cars now. Um, and a couple of the uh, the uh, rental kind of car companies or pickup services uh, are are looking to get into it as well. In the in the the major uh, cities mm -hmm. like Boston and LA and that kind of stuff. I had read the article that uh, in production, we're not that far away on production of these things. I mean, and no, no, no. that Uber or Lyft, and for our uh, maybe some of our older audience at home, uh, that's what everybody's using instead of taxis. You they come right to your door. That both Uber and Lyft have like ordered every self-driving car is going to be manufactured in the next couple of years because that's where they see the future of if you need to go someplace, you order up the car and it drives up and picks you up and takes you where you need to go. Right. Yeah, yeah it, it's uh, like I said, it'll be here sooner than I think a lot of people think. Wow, that's it. That is interesting stuff. Uh, when you worked for General Motors and and you were in the executive side of life and as we talked about your career where you were upperly mobile all these spots are there do you pick where you want to go or does somebody in the higher levels of general motors say hey i think parcel would be a good fit for this particular job or do you have a godfather in the <laughs> corporation how's that work yeah not really a godfather but uh, there are you know there are mentors and people that look out for you and that kind of stuff but uh, yeah, basically it's, uh, it's you go where they ask you to go, mm -hmm. for the most part, yeah. right? I mean, you could say no. Yeah. Uh, how much fun would that be, right? Yeah, you might not get asked the next time. <laughs> That's right. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, you, you put in all the work, you get in front of the right people, um, you get results, and then they come tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, what do you think about doing this? Just, just like you mentioned earlier, they attacked me on the shoulder and said, what about yeah. Singapore? Yeah. yeah. So now you're retired. So you did Singapore, you came back to the tech center for a little bit. Uh, graduated Marine City High in 79, as you mentioned, and went off to do the, your General Motors thing, moved your family all over the country. Why? What made you and your wife, Jean, say, you know what, when we retire, we're going to live back close to Marine City or close to family? What, what, 
Yeah. What was that all about? Well, I, I think the first decision was the family, you mm -hmm. know, having, being around our parents and our sisters and brothers and cousins and aunts and uncles and mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, so that was a big draw, but I mean, the, the town is just, it's, a, it's an amazing little city. I mean, it's, it's got everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and the water is, I mean, the river is the river. It doesn't mm -hmm. get any better than that. Well, that's good. And when you made that decision, uh, and then your younger brother's an architect in Colorado, and you called Eddie and said, hey, I need somebody to design a house. And, and then you had another cousin says, uh, he, he's a builder. Well, I'll build it, Bob. And, yep. and the rest is history. Yeah. Bob, if we took you into Marine City High School today and say we gathered the juniors and seniors, National Honor Society, or kids that really wanted to, to have a career, what, what kind of advice would you have for, for kids now, knowing what you know after spending the last 35 years yeah. doing your business? Well, I, I, would, I think the first thing that pops into my head is that, you know, a strong work ethic. Um, that's the way I was raised. Uh, by my father and mother, um, and and you get you know you got to work hard. Mm -hmm. That's there's there's no option, right? If you want to go do something, there's no option. Um, and then be open to change, you know, be flexible. Uh, you know, just because you don't become the president of the company when you graduate doesn't mean you can't be. Yeah. But you got to be able to to learn and move and, and grow well, and, and everything. And I think it's different too and you know you mentioned your dad once uh, uh, your dad Bob was uh, a General Motors guy back at the time when people they got a job and they stayed with their job for 30 or 35 right. years. It yeah. doesn't seem you had the opportunity to move around because it was such a large company but the the trend now appears to me that People spend two, three, four years and then make a move. Yeah. And uh, no, I agree. And, and I think our graduates uh, need to be a little nimble. And so many of the jobs that are out there now, and you talked about the technology in the auto industry, so many of the things that are going to be viable opportunities don't even exist right now as yeah, these right. kids graduate. Yeah. So you've got to be yeah. uh, willing to to adjust, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you got to well, be Bob, flexible. Bob, it's been great having you. Thank and, you. And uh, for our listeners at home, this has uh, been a conversation with Bob Parcell. Uh, originally from Marine City, now he's back after an illustrious career at General Motors. Um, the uh, If anybody uh, at home would like to catch this uh, show in uh, total, just go to our website. It's watchctv.org. Click on Conversations. In any of the conversations we've had over the last year, year and a half, uh, are available on your computer. But we'd like to thank Bob for being our guest today and once again introducing you to people who have made a difference and who will make the Blue Water area a great place to live. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Tom. You've been watching Conversations with Tom Shorkey. Conversations explores the past, the present, and the future of the communities in which we live through the eyes of interesting individuals. If you have an idea for a future conversation, please contact us at www.watchctv.org. Thanks for watching Conversations with Tom Shorkey.